Greetings, scholars and colleagues. Winter enrichment is my favorite season of the Coust year, and each successive one of our 12 programs seems to surpass the previous. Being virtualized puts a handicap in this one, but it opens up the keynote series to the world. From whichever registered or social media portal you're joining us from whatever time zone, welcome to Coust. Being virtual means that uh, not only can we share WEP with the world, but we can draw the world's most interesting speakers into our electronic communion, as is about to occur with a talk from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I'm proud to say that the speaker is a former colleague of mine at Columbia University. Though his appointment was in sociology and mine in engineering, he was my across the hall neighbor at Broadway and 120th Street. That is, until he left Columbia for Yahoo Research Labs further downtown in 2007, where, as principal research scientist, he could afford to hire many more postdocs than we can in academia. After five years doing analytics at Yahoo, he co-founded the New York City branch of Microsoft Research, and then in 2019, he saw the light and returned to academia as the Stevens University professor at UPenn with appointments in four departments in four different schools, sociology, computer and information science, the Annenberg School of Communication, and the renowned Wharton School, which became the first business school in the world when it was founded in 1881. He has also been an external faculty member at the Santa Fe Institute. To say then that Professor Duncan Watts is multidisciplinary borders on understatement. The domain of his expertise, networks, touches nearly every discipline from sociology to biology to epidemiology to communication to transportation to energy to economics to geopolitics and to the interrelationships of all human knowledge and culture as indexed online and exposed by search engines. Well, the list goes on and all of these applications fit comfortably within our 2021 winter enrichment theme of connectivity. A lot of new science and technology as well as two popular books have flowed from Duncan's PhD thesis at Cornell University 23 years ago entitled The Structure and Dynamics of Small World Systems. Abstracted in 1998 in Nature, Duncan's primary thesis paper alone currently has nearly 45,000 citations at Google Scholar. I don't think any Kaust PhD thesis papers are there quite yet, but his is an existence proof of the possibility. Prior to Cornell, Duncan received a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of New South Wales as a student in Australia's Defence Force Academy. In fact, Duncan was a commissioned officer in the Royal Australian Navy, and I guess that warns you about his accent. 
Well, there's no clear way to pack Duncan's interest into one hour, but we're about to get a small projection of his work into the time allowed and we can pose questions to him. So scholars, please feel free to enter your questions into your portal during the lecture. Duncan, please take it away. Thanks, David. It's, uh, it's great to see you again all these years later. Um, and I'm really delighted to be here uh, today uh, to talk to you and your students and colleagues. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here and go into presentation, presentation mode. See that now? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, talk to you today about uh, the, the work, some of the work that I've been doing over the last uh, 20 something years uh, that uh, touch on this notion, this notion it raised of uh, doing research in between disciplines. Uh, and I wanna start by telling you about the problem that got me interested in network science many, many years ago when I was a graduate student at Cornell. Uh, and the way I want to introduce it uh, is through, through a play that was written by John Guare in 1990. Uh, and the play, uh, it's an interesting play about uh, some uh, rich people on the Upper East Side of, of Manhattan and their encounter with a young black man uh, and uh, the, what they learn about themselves and about race and class uh, in, the, in the process. But midway through the play, uh, this character, Weezer Kittredge, who was played by Stocker Channing in the movie that came out a couple of years later, uh, says this uh, interesting, uh, makes this interesting statement to her daughter. She says, I read somewhere that everybody on this planet is separated by only six other people, six degrees of separation between us and everybody else on the planet. And she then goes on to list some of the types of people that you can be connected to. And she makes this very important point that it's not just big names. It's not just the president of the United States. It's not just people who work in your profession or who uh, are part of your social milieu or who look like you or sound like you. But it could be a native in a rainforest, a Tierra del Fuego, an Eskimo. She says she's bound to everybody on the planet by a trail of six people. And then she says, it's a profound thought. And I want to emphasize that it really is a profound thought, that we have heard this expression, six degrees of separation, so many times now, that you might think it's, it's uh, obvious or self-evident or a matter of common sense. But once you really think about it, that you can connect to everybody on the planet, regardless of who they are or how far away they are or how different they are from you through just six people, you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows that person, it starts to seem anything but obvious. And in fact, back in the early 1990s, it was not at all obvious and many people thought that it was just an urban legend. There was some evidence. Uh, there was a remarkable experiment that was done uh, in the 1960s by the social psychologist Stanley Milgram and his graduate student, Jeffrey Travers, who designed this very clever uh, experiment where he gave uh, a, 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 a packet, which you can see on the right-hand side here, uh, to, uh, to 100 people uh, in uh, the city of Boston and also in Omaha, Nebraska. And he said the, the packet contained some instructions that were of the sort, you have to get this packet to this particular person who was a, a, a stockbroker who lived uh, outside of Boston in Sharon, Massachusetts. Uh, but you, you can only send this packet to that person if you, if you happen to know him uh, on a first name basis. And assuming that you do not know him on a first name basis, which is pretty unlikely, you have to instead send the packet to someone you do know on a first name basis who you think is closer to the target somehow uh, than, uh, than you are. And he left uh, un somewhat vague what he meant by closer. So everybody got these instructions. They sent the packets to their friends, uh, their friends sent it to their friends, their friends sent it to their friends and so on. And of the 300 roughly letter chains that began, uh, 64 of them or about 20% reached the target person and the average length of the chains that reached the target was six. Uh, and so this is where this expression, or at least where we believe this expression, six degrees of separation comes from. Uh, Milgram, interestingly, never used that expression himself. It was Guare who coined the phrase, but you can see here from Milgram's data 
that the average is roughly five intermediaries and five intermediaries is the same as six degrees of separation. And you can see an example chain here uh, on the right hand side of somebody who uh, begins in Omaha and then sends the message to a friend in Iowa who sends it to someone in Indiana, who sends it to someone in Tennessee, who sends it to someone in Virginia, who sends it to someone in New York, who sends it to uh, the target in Sharon, Massachusetts. Okay, so there's some evidence that this can work. Uh, and if you think about it for a second, you can convince yourself that it's not so complicated. And so let's just do a little back of the envelope calculation. Let's assume that uh, you pick a random person in the world. Let's pick our target person in Sharon, Massachusetts and assume that they have a hundred friends. And that's a very conservative assumption. Most people have more than that. Uh, your average number of friends on Facebook these days is, is uh, roughly a few hundred. So everybody has at least a hundred friends. And now let's imagine that each of those people have a hundred friends. So uh, the target person has a, a hundred friends at one degree of separation and 10,000 friends at two degrees of separation uh, and a million friends at three degrees of separation. And if you keep uh, increasing exponentially like that within five degrees, you can easily encompass uh, all uh, of the people on the planet. And so you might say from a back of the envelope calculation like this, oh, it's actually not that surprising. Uh, it's pretty easy uh, for everybody on the planet to be connected by just six degrees of separation. But there's a really critical assumption that we've made in this back of the envelope calculation, which is that none of our, none of our friends are to each other, right? That you're just assuming that everybody is picking friends randomly from the population of the entire planet. And if you think about that for a second, you realize that nothing could be more unrealistic, right? That's not just uh, an assumption or a simplifying assumption. It's a really terrible assumption that uh, in fact, uh, there are lots of ways in which uh, social networks exhibit structure. Uh, and there's an enormous amount of research on this over really the last century, which shows that uh, people are more likely to be friends with, uh, that the, 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 the people that you're friends with are more likely to be similar to you on, on virtually all dimensions you can think of than, than a random stranger. So that's a principle called homophily. Uh, the dynamic version of that is that over time, the people that you come to know in the future are largely determined by the people that you, uh, that you know right now. So you, you are introduced to new friends by mutual friends. That's what's called triadic closure. Another very dominant mechanism for the formation of new friendships uh, is, uh, is what's called closure, which is uh, the, uh, the fact that people uh, get to know each other through shared contexts. For example, uh, you are all members of the same course right now. And so by virtue of taking a class together, you are much more likely to become friends uh, with the people in your class than somebody else who is equally similar, but is not in the same class. So that's another very uh, common measure. And of course, spatial dependency also matters a lot, even in, in today's uh, highly virtual world. Uh, there's still a lot of evidence that the more physically proximate we, uh, physically proximate we are, uh, the more likely we are to become acquainted. And so you put all of these different mechanisms together uh, and uh, what you realize is that uh, social networks uh, completely uh, are almost sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum to the uh, back of the envelope calculation that I showed you. Rather than having no local structure, they have an enormous amount of local structure. And in fact, they have structure at many different scales. Uh, in your in your local e ego network, at the level of groups, communities, organizations, even up until the level of entire countries. And so the difficult or puzzling small world problem uh, is is not that it's uh, you you know that you can't possibly construct a network that has uh, this six degrees of separation uh, property, but that you want to be able to construct a network that has uh, a lot of local order. Uh, in which most of your friends are also friends of each other, and yet still has this small world global property as if we're talking about a random network. Now, this is a, 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 a problem that people realized a long time ago, uh, even before Milgram, uh, there was a very nice paper by, uh, by uh, Manfred Cochin and Ithiel Poole, a mathematician and a political scientist at MIT, who, who really sort of posed the problem in this way. And what they realized at the end of, of, uh, of their paper 
written in the 1950s, uh, is that the presence of all of this messy structure on multiple scales made the math uh, too difficult uh, to, uh, to work out with a pencil and paper. And it was really because of the theoretical difficulty that Poole and Cochin encountered that Milgram took an experimental approach in the first place. And so after Milgram, uh, this, this problem really lay fallow for a few decades. The theory was too difficult to work out. The experiments are extraordinarily difficult to perform at scale. Uh, and the data that one would need to test it uh, had been impossible to collect. The, you know, even though social network analysis was a, was a, a flourishing discipline uh, in, uh, in the uh, US sociology uh, in the 1970s and 80s, the types of, uh, the, the only way that people could collect network data back in those days was to go out with a survey instrument and ask people, uh, everybody uh, individually, you know, who are your friends? And then try to reconstruct networks from the answers that people gave them. And using that kind of uh, manual method uh, meant that the, the largest networks that people had been able to study were you know, a, a, at most a couple of hundred and you can't even really test the small world hypothesis on networks at that scale. So when I was a, a graduate student in the mid 1990s uh, working with a mathematician, Steven Strogatz, uh, we encountered this problem and we started to think about it. Uh, and we had the advantage uh, uh, even at that time, that uh, in the interim, computers had become much faster. And so we could ask a different type of question rather than asking the question that Milgram had asked, namely, how small is the actual world that we live in? We asked a somewhat different question, which is, if we could imagine all possible networks, what are the conditions that would be required for any network to have this combination of properties that we would like to obtain? this local uh, ordering uh, with uh, the short global path lengths. And so the way we did that was the following, and there are actually many ways to do this. This is just a very simple way. Uh, but uh, the, the way we did it is to start with a network that you can see on the left-hand side. This is a, a schematic. The, the real networks we studied were much larger. But the idea is that you create a network in which everybody is standing around in a ring uh, and they are connected to just their nearest neighbors and their, and their next nearest. And so that's what you can see in this picture here. So this is a network that clearly has a lot of local structure that everybody's friends are highly likely to be friends of each other by virtue of, of the, the way we've, we've set things up. But if you wanna get a message from uh, somebody uh, to somebody on the other side of the ring, the only way to do that is to pass as this network becomes large, that number of hops is going to become large also. And we'll see that uh, in some very simple math on the next slide. So the trick that we then used is to take uh, every one of these uh, edges in this network uh, and with some probability P, randomly rewire the edge. And what that means is we pick up one end of the edge uh, and we can see we have done that here. This edge here has been broken and we've picked up one end of the edge and moved it somewhere else in the network at random. And so this uh, method of random rewiring conserves the total number of edges in the network, but just introduces uh, randomness in a very controlled way. And so by picking, by specifying this parameter P, we can go from uh, this perfect one dimensional lattice uh, all the way through to something that is an approximation of a random graph when P equals one and all the edges have been rewired. And then in the middle, we have something that is a mixture of order and randomness. And so uh, we can, at the extremes, it is possible to do some simple math and to uh, convince yourself that uh, when P equals zero, you have this ordered world. Uh, and as I just mentioned, uh, the number of steps, the, the average, the, the shortest, uh, the average path length in the network uh, is given by this expression. N is the number of nodes in the network and K uh, is the number of nearest neighbors. And so you can see that this, when N is much larger than K, when the world is much larger than the number, the, the number of people in the world is much larger than the number of friends you have, uh, then this average shortest path length is going to be very large as well. And in particular, it's going to scale linearly with the number of people. So you double the number of people in the world, you double the average shortest path length. Meanwhile, the clustering coefficient is very high uh, that uh, in the limit where K becomes large, the uh, 
chances that two of your friends are friends of each other is is about 75%, which is you know high uh, uh, relative to the true empirical value, um, but uh, is useful as a uh, uh, as an, uh, a mathematical exercise. At the other extreme, in this random world, uh, we have the opposite combination of properties. So here, the path lengths scale like the log of the number of, of uh, nodes in the network. So this is uh, about as short uh, as a path length uh, can be in a sparse graph. But the clustering coefficient uh, is proportional to uh, k divided by n. So again, as n becomes very large, the probability that two of your friends uh, are friends of each other goes to zero. And so if you look at these two extremes, your intuition would be that the world can have one combination of properties, but, but not can have either combination of properties. Uh, it can be large and highly clustered, or it can be small and poorly clustered, but it can't be small and highly clustered. And this is the combination that we want. And yet, if we look in the middle, and here we can see uh, the, the, the values of uh, the clustering coefficient and uh, the average shortest path length, uh, in this case, to put them on the same axis with We've uh, scaled each one of them or normalized each one of them by their values uh, at p equals zero. And so everything is on, a, on the scale from zero to one. You can see that as we introduce uh, more and more randomness, the clustering coefficient decreases uh, quite slowly. So uh, at this point here where only 1% of the edges have been randomly rewired, the clustering coefficient has barely budged. It's almost identical to what it was uh, in a world with uh, zero rewiring. Meanwhile, the path length has plummeted uh, and is almost at uh, its asymptotic limit. So what this is showing you is that a tiny fraction of, uh, of random uh, shortcuts uh, in, a, in a very large uh, network can have an enormous effect on contracting uh, uh, distances, degrees of separation while maintaining uh, the impression to anybody in the network that they are living in a highly clustered world. And so these networks uh, in the middle, where we have uh, uh, high uh, clustering and short uh, global path lengths, are what we call small world networks. And the intuition for how this works is that the path length and clustering coefficient are driven by different, uh, different uh, properties the path length is governed by the absolute number or total number of random shortcuts uh, in, the, in the network, which is the, uh, the product of P and N. So P N is the total number of shortcuts. And a surprising fact that we learned later is that roughly just five shortcuts in an infinite uh, graph will reduce the average path length by a factor of, 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 of 50%. And so you have the, you have the, number of degrees of separation between everybody in the world and everybody else in the world with just five shortcuts, a really remarkable fact. However, the clustering coefficient is governed by the fraction of shortcuts. So you can see here that for very large networks, simply by uh, jacking n up uh, to a very large number for any fixed value of p, you can get a small world network. So you can make p uh, arbitrarily small, and then just by making n large, you can get a network that has uh, a, 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 a path length that is comparable to a random graph and a, uh, and a clustering coefficient that is arbitrarily close to its original value. So the result of this uh, simulation exercise and some, some simple mathematical modeling is that this initial puzzle of how can the world uh, uh, be small in spite of the presence of social order is sort of flipped on its head. That in fact, the conditions to have a small world network are somewhat trivial. That almost as long as you have any, uh, any mechanism that generates local order and even a tiny amount of randomness, you're going to get this combination. And so that led us to make a prediction uh, or, or actually a couple of different predictions. First, that small world networks should be generic, that these are things that we should not just uh, see once, but that we should see all over the place. And the second prediction is that it really has nothing to do with social networks at all, that there are, of course, social mechanisms in social networks that, that result in 
uh, in in local clustering, the ones that I that I just described to you, those are, are are mechanisms that are specific to social networks. But in biological networks, you have other kinds of 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 uh, of ordering properties that make uh, 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 friends or, or or neighbors in a network more likely to be connected than at random. Simple, uh, you know, energetic considerations or or physical proximity. Uh, all of these uh, are are reasons why. Uh, you should see local clustering in a network. So the the particular mechanism will depend on the domain, but the but the property of local order should span across domains. And of course, in a similar way, uh, there are different types of randomness in the world. And the claim here is that any uh, any randomness at all will do the trick. And so, having made that prediction from this very very simple model, we wanted to go and check it with some data. But as I just mentioned, you know, even in the 1990s, network data was was very rare, and I'll talk about how that changed uh, in just a moment. Uh, but you know, back then it was really impossible to imagine uh, a, 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 a company like Facebook, uh, which was literally connecting, uh, you know, a couple of has literally connected a couple of billion people. Nothing like that uh, existed uh, back in the 1990s. And in fact, nothing like that was imaginable. And I know that because I tried very hard to imagine it uh, and I thought uh, that it would be impossible. So uh, we went around looking for networks to try to test our hypothesis on. Uh, and we were able to find just three examples, one social network, one engineering network, and one biological network. The social network was one that you may have heard of. Uh, it's a network of movie actors connected by having acted in movies together. And it was made famous right around the time that I was writing my dissertation uh, by a game called the Kevin Bacon game uh, in which a group of fraternity brothers uh, in Pennsylvania had uh, decided that Kevin Bacon was unbeknownst to everybody, the center of the movie universe. Uh, it turns out that he's not the center of the movie universe, but uh, it, it, what they discovered is that you could connect Kevin Bacon to everybody else in just a few steps uh, by virtue of having acted together in other movies. Uh, they could have, of course, have picked anybody else that they had thought of and found the same result, but they just happened to pick Kevin Bacon. Uh, and so this game came about. Uh, we were uh, very fortunate to get hold of the data that was uh, had been compiled by a computer scientist called Brett Jaden uh, at the University of Virginia, and he gave us um, uh, the network data. And you can see the 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 it had uh, this network at the time had a couple of hundred thousand nodes, and uh, and most uh, the average number of uh, connections was about sixty. So that was the first network. The second network was a very different network that we got from some colleagues uh, of ours in the engineering uh, school at Cornell who studied uh, power transmission uh, networks, uh, and they uh, had uh, data for the power transmission grid of the Western United States. So this is high voltage. Uh, uh, this is uh, power stations and substations connected by high voltage transmission cables. So it's a very different type of networks. The nodes are completely different. The edges are completely different. But once again, it can be written as a network and it's, uh, it's rather large, almost 5,000 nodes and it's extremely sparse. Uh, only about uh, each of these power stations is connected to an average of uh, less than or fewer than three other power stations. And then finally, we were able to find a biological network that was really sort of at the limit of what we considered to be large and sparse. Uh, this is the neuronal network of the worm C. elegans. Uh, it was at the time, and I believe still is, the only neuronal network uh, that has been fully mapped out uh, because it is uh, even as tiny as it is, uh, you know, doing mapping out neuronal networks is, a, is an extraordinary exercise. Sidney Brenner won the Nobel Prize uh, for doing this. Uh, so this is really a big deal. Uh, and this network has uh, fewer than 300 nodes uh, and an average degree of about 14. So we have these three networks. And then in this table here, you can see uh, the first two columns show you the actual average path length, uh, average path length. And the third column shows you the actual clustering coefficient. And the second and fourth columns show you what you would get for path length and clustering if it were a random graph with the same uh, size and density. And you can see that the first two columns are rather similar, that the, uh, that the path lengths are pretty close, uh, and yet the clustering coefficient is much, much larger, in some cases orders of magnitude larger than what you would expect uh, in a comparable random graph. And this final column shows you the, two, the ratio of ratios or what people call the small world quotient 
Uh, and you can see that for all of these uh, networks, uh, it's bigger than one. And uh, in the case of movie actors, it's you know thousands of times bigger than one. So that was uh, that was the work that we did. And since then, uh, small world networks have been discovered uh, in a, a very large number of domains, uh, up to networks of, of vastly greater scale uh, than the ones uh, that we were able to study. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, the biggest such network, uh, the Facebook social graph, uh, was shown to be very conclusively uh, a small world network. And you can see a picture of the, of the Facebook uh, social graph uh, over here on the right-hand side. Okay, another thing that we did to uh, uh, some years later uh, was uh, in addition to uh, uh, computing path lengths on, uh, on, on networks, the data for which we could collect the data, we also tried to replicate Milgram's experiment, uh, except on a much larger scale. So this is work done with Peter Dodds and Roby Muhammad. Uh, and it shows you uh, in, on the picture on the right-hand side, uh, several thousand people scattered around the world trying to reach a target person, uh, who in this case is my old uh, PhD advisor, Stephen Strogatz, who lives uh, in Ithaca, New York, uh, where that red dot is on the, on the uh, bottom right-hand corner here. And so you can see the, the purple dots up on the top left show the several thousand uh, individuals who were assigned uh, to try to get a message to Steve. And then as you go down the left-hand side and then down the right-hand side, you can see how these messages have converged from around the world uh, to Ithaca, New York. And so we did an exercise like that uh, rather than for one target, which Milgram had for 18 different targets in 13 countries. Uh, we had 21,000 people trying to get messages uh, they, uh, those messages passed through 163 countries and about 60 odd thousand people uh, on the way to their targets uh, and uh, almost 500 of them completed. Uh, the average length uh, was smaller than what Milgram found, but the reason for that is that many more of these messages uh, failed to complete. And as you can uh, see, if you think about it for a second, uh, the, 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 the longer a chain is in reality, the more likely it is not to complete because somebody just doesn't pass it along. And so you have to correct for that. And when we correct for that, we find that the median length of the chains was between five and seven, depending on whether targets were in the same country, target and sender were in the same country or not. And so this number is actually surprisingly similar to the number that Milgram found uh, and, and, and really uh, validates Milgram's uh, initial result. And so we've learned a lot about this small world problem uh, and we have a good understanding of how it works. Uh, it has uh, some really surprisingly rich properties and it is itself an interdisciplinary problem. It started off as a puzzle in sociology or even really in, in pop culture. Uh, it became a math puzzle. It then became a puzzle in computer science. It's led to novel experiments and, and given us insights about uh, the structure of social networks and how people navigate through them. Uh, it also uh, led researchers to start thinking about other properties of networks. Uh, and that uh, exercise has led to a burgeoning field that we now call network science. And, and there's uh, some really fantastic textbooks that are now available in many courses. I teach a course on network science at, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, as you uh, know, and as David mentioned, uh, it has applications uh, in, in many different areas of, of physics, uh, of engineering, of biology. And, uh, and this past year, I think we have seen uh, with, uh, with great clarity the importance of network science uh, in trying to understand the spread of infectious disease. So, I want to switch gears here uh, and talk about, uh, you know, what happened uh, after uh, that work. And what happened is that the world changed. Uh, the, you know, this was, uh, you know, work that I started in the in the late 1990s, as I mentioned, uh, and we were really reliant on on computers uh, to do uh, simulations of systems that were too complicated uh, to do pencil and paper analysis with. But we're still pretty simple. They were pretty toy models, uh, and we were we were you know really using the computer as a way to uh, enhance our intuition and to do thought experiments uh, about the structure of the world as it might be. What was happening in the real world uh, was that uh, the web had transformed and was transforming 
uh, industry after industry. Uh, and so we went from a world where most activities were uh, done in an offline analog way to a world uh, in which almost everything was being done online in a digital way. Uh, and that happened uh, initially with uh, email and then blogs uh, and then online dating services and then early uh, social networking services, uh, search engines. Uh, and then <clears throat> of course, e-commerce sites uh, became uh, extremely popular and dominant. Uh, and you know now uh, almost everything that we do is 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 mediated uh, one way or another by the internet. Um, and in the course of doing all of that, uh, it's generating, as we all know now, and as we really are focused on these days, an enormous amount of data, data that is generated by people in the course of their everyday activities, uh, communicating with each other, uh, 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 conducting, uh, economic transactions, um, sharing things, listening to music, uh, uh, consuming news. Almost everything we do is generating data about our behavior. And so this uh, technological revolution that happened in the world has led to a scientific revolution uh, in social science. Uh, and this started to become clear to me and to some of my colleagues uh, in a you know, sort of roughly the mid 2000s uh, where uh, the, uh, the, the scale and scope and granularity of data was revealed to be of a qualitatively different nature than the sort of data that uh, social scientists had uh, been familiar with for, for many years earlier, mostly uh, survey data and administrative data uh, that was collected by governments. Uh, and in, in place of that, we have this sort of uh, what we call big data or digital data or digital exhaust uh, people use different uh, expressions for it. Data that has been thrown off from uh, all of these other platforms that were uh, designed to do different things. But there is another development uh, that has also been of great interest to me, uh, which is that the platforms uh, that, uh, that we have created also allow us to do experiments on a, on a, on a much greater scale and at greater speed uh, than we have been able to do in the past. So for example, that replication of the small world experiment involved over 60,000 people from all over the world and they were all volunteers. You know, we didn't have to pay them. Uh, they, they did it because they thought it was interesting. Uh, and uh, we were able to do a really sort of unprecedented uh, type of experiment uh, simply because uh, the web made it possible. So the combination of these uh, of these uh, uh, changes of the, the the impact of big data and big experiments has led to what we now call computational social science, an interdisciplinary field that sits really at the intersection of the the, the computational sciences uh, and the social sciences. Um, and so uh, I want to talk for the rest of my uh, the next uh, ten minutes or so about computational social science. And I, I want to divide it into uh, the big data component and the big experiments. So, uh, I'm, and really I'm going to go very fast here. I, I'm not going to talk about any of these projects in, in detail. I just want to show you uh, some snapshots of, of projects that, that my colleagues and I have worked on over the years that sort of illustrate the types of questions that we can uh, answer now or investigate now that would have been very difficult to answer in the past. So for example, we can uh, investigate uh, the, both the, the, the static and, whoops, uh, and, uh, and dynamic structure of social networks you know, using email. And we've written several papers uh, uh, investigating uh, how uh, uh, social ties form and, and die uh, using email data uh, as, uh, uh, as our proxy uh, for our, our observable proxy for these unobservable uh, uh, social ties. Um, we can uh, use search queries to make predictions about consumer behavior. Uh, so just looking at uh, what people are searching for turns out to be a reasonable predictor of how much uh, revenue a movie is going to uh, generate when it opens, uh, how much money video games uh, will, uh, will generate uh, when they go on sale, and uh, how popular a song will be. We can uh, use Twitter, and in fact, there's an entire industry of computational social scientists who use Twitter to, uh, to measure various things. 
uh, some of our early work looked at uh, Twitter as a way to measure social influence uh, and also attention. And so there's a variety of interesting results about uh, how we can predict uh, you know, how many retweets uh, a particular tweet is going to get. Uh, and it turns out that the most predictive feature is, is, is a very simple one, just how uh, successful has that particular user been in the past. Uh, interestingly though, content features that we spend so much time thinking about turn out not to be very predictive at all. So this was a surprising result, or certainly surprising to many people, including us. Uh, we're also able to look at who people pay attention to. And it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, the, I think this would be even more extreme now, but 10 years ago, uh, the, you know, as, as, uh, as large and decentralized as Twitter is in principle, uh, it turns out that, you know, half of all the tweets that people consume uh, are actually originate from, from a relatively small number of, uh, of accounts. Uh, and my guess is that that's even more extreme now than it was uh, back in 2011. We can also do something uh, quite different from previous studies of uh, diffusion, where we can not only see how popular have things become, but we can map out the exact structure of a diffusion cascade. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, you know, that even uh, cascades of exactly the same size, and here we see uh, some examples of cascades that are all roughly the same size. They all have uh, a few hundred uh, retweets uh, and they all have uh, uh, progressed over time in a similar way. But you can see at the very granular level, they have very different structures. Uh, and this is what we call structural virality. Some, uh, some cascades have a very broadcasty uh, uh, nat uh, nature to them. So this is an example of a, of a tweet that uh, this black triangle means that a single, this is a CNN story. So CNN tweets out a story and then a lot of people retweet the story and that's basically all that happens. And down the bottom right here, you see something that looks like a very viral cascade with many generations and only a few retweets at each generation. Uh, it got to about the same number of people, but it did so in a very different way. Uh, we can also uh, invent new ways to think about causality. Uh, so rather than uh, coming up with some uh, clever instrument like the weather uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, generate uh, exogenous variation, we can actually find it by mining through uh, uh, browser logs. Uh, in this case, uh, we did this with uh, Amazon uh, browser data. Um, uh, and we were able to estimate the causal effect of recommendations on, uh, on uh, uh, different uh, product sales uh, simply by finding examples of where um, a product had seen a, a, an unexplained spike uh, in attention. So we used that as an instrument uh, and uh, were able to uh, 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 estimate uh, the, the causal rather than the uh, naive uh, um, percentage of, of clicks on the focal product. And you can see down the bottom here uh, that, uh, that, the, the, uh, that the causal estimate is much lower than the naive estimate. Uh, we can also uh, investigate some rather fundamental questions about how well we can predict uh, outcomes in complex social systems and whether those outcomes are subject to a fundamental limit. And it appears that they may be. Uh, that uh, you know, even if you build more and more complex models of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, machine learning models of uh, success uh, in 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 a simple environment like Twitter, uh, you very quickly run into uh, an asymptote where adding more features does not help your predictive performance at all. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is a, a follow-up study to the the one that I showed you earlier. Uh, we can use exactly the same feature that I mentioned, this past success of the, of the, the, the initial uh, user. And it turns out that that very simple model uh, with just one feature is almost as good as the most complex uh, machine learning model that we, could, that we could throw at this problem. Something that, that had uh, you know, all kinds of details about the, uh, about the user and the, the content uh, of the, the tweet itself rather strongly that there is a, a really a, a fundamental limit to how, uh, to how much, uh, to how well you can predict uh, outcomes, even in a very simple environment like Twitter, that, uh, that in all of these uh, 
uh, sorts of phenomenon, there is always going to be uh, a large amount of unexplained variance due to randomness in the world. And that's something that we may just have to live with. And then finally, a very recent study that just came out last year, uh, we're using uh, data from uh, the Nielsen company uh, that uh, allows us to get a, a, a panoptic view of media consumption uh, uh, across television uh, and mobile and desktop uh, over three years uh, for a representative sample of Americans. Uh, and you can see from this one picture that, uh, you know, first of all, people consume a lot of media several hours a day uh, through these different, um, uh, uh, different platforms. Most of it, the vast majority of it has nothing to do with news. It's people uh, looking for entertainment or, or other kinds of information, uh, sports, et cetera. Uh, the green bars show you uh, the, uh, the news related content. And you can see from that, that the dark green dominates the light green. So when you think about news, uh, it's really television that people are getting news from. So for all of the attention that's been paid to, to online and social media news in the last several years, uh, the, the, the vast majority of news consumption is really uh, television. That's where, that's where the action is at. Uh, and then finally, uh, the fake news, which, which has been a, a topic of, of great consternation for uh, since the 2016 election and Brexit and other uh, uh, incidents in the last few years is barely visible in this picture. So, uh, you know, what this suggests uh, is that if we want to understand uh, problems to do with political polarization and misinformation, we really have to look in some of these other bars here, that it's not just, you know, outright false information that is causing people to believe wrong-headed things. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, so-called legitimate news sources uh, and other kinds of information as well. So this just gives you a flavor of the sorts of questions that we can now uh, answer uh, with using computational methods and, and digital data. Uh, but I want to talk about experiments as well, because this is something I, I really uh, have uh, enjoyed uh, working on over the last decade or two. Uh, and the point I want to make uh, really is that, uh, you know, behavioral experiments, as, as you may know, uh, have been around for a long time uh, in the psychology, uh, in, in psychology and, in, and more recently in economics and other social sciences. Uh, and the reason why researchers like to do experiments is because they convey a lot of control. Uh, they allow you to uh, infer causality um, and they allow you to sort of uh, set up a very uh, well-defined question, but they have a lot of limitations. Uh, it's, uh, they're very artificial, as you can see from these, uh, these photos. The tasks that you can do in them are pretty simple. You can only uh, have a small number of people in, in one of these rooms at any one time, uh, and you're uh, you're, you're, you're pretty restricted in the types of people that you can, at least in practice, study. And so this acronym WEIRD stands for Western uh, Educated Industrial uh, Rich Democracies. Uh, and uh, it's uh, estimated um, uh, that uh, almost about 95% of uh, experimental subjects in, uh, uh, in, in the field of psychology uh, come from uh, countries uh, basically in, in, in Western Europe and the US and Australia. And of that 70% are American undergraduates. So most of what we know about 70% of what we know about human psychology is based on American undergraduates. Um, and so uh, if you think that that sounds like uh, not a representative sample of the world population, then you might wonder about some of these results. And then finally, uh, because you can only put undergraduates in a lab uh, ethically for some short amount of time, we really only know about phenomenon that unfold on very short timescales. So experiments are great for testing specific theories, uh, but they're not great for external validity. They're not great for learning about how things work in the real world. And of course, they're very expensive and slow. And so the hope is that uh, by moving experiments uh, online, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, design uh, experiments that work for a much larger population, so we can increase the scale. Uh, we can run them for much longer uh, rather than for hours. We can run them for days or weeks or months, uh, and we can make them much more complex. So just again, to give you a few examples, and I'll, I'll really sort of, I, I know we're running out of time here, so I'll try to just sort of skim over these. Uh, an example from, uh, from many years ago now is a, 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 a project called Music Lab that was done with, um, my colleagues, Matt Selganik and Peter Dodds. 
Uh, and we uh, brought in uh, 15,000 or 14,000 participants uh, online and had them listen to songs uh, that they by bands they hadn't heard of. And some of them uh, were making these choices uh, about which songs they liked and which songs they wanted to download uh, independently. And others were shown, as we can see on the right-hand side, how many times those songs had been downloaded by people ahead of them. So they had a, a social influence signal. And what we found is that the presence of social influence simultaneously uh, increased uh, inequality and unpredictability. So what that means is popular songs became more popular, unpopular songs became less popular. Um, but it also became more difficult to predict uh, which songs uh, would become the most popular. And so once again, this uh, uh, pushes us to think about the limits of predictability and also teaches us how markets, rather than just revealing preferences, actually uh, actively construct them. But the point I want to make here is that this experiment uh, involved uh, tens of thousands of people coming into a lab. Uh, and that it was really the minimal number of people that we that we needed to, to test this particular hypothesis. And so this experiment simply could not have been done in the physical lab. We don't have that many undergraduates uh, at Columbia University, which is where I was at the time. Uh, and you know, to have brought uh, that, that many people in one by one into a lab uh, would have taken us uh, many years. Uh, pushing out on a different dimension, uh, we did another uh, project where we uh, studied what we call crisis mapping. Crisis mapping is something that happens uh, in the real world. It's been around for about a decade now where groups of online volunteers get together uh, and, uh, and, and follow a particular crisis, usually a natural disaster unfolding uh, in some part of the world. This, is, uh, this was a, a, an earthquake in, in, that hit Haiti in 2010. Um, and uh, there's lots of information out there from, uh, from social media and from uh, uh, other uh, digital sources. Uh, these online volunteers collate that information and create these crisis maps uh, that are then useful to uh, organizations like the UN. We were able to take this uh, very real world activity and replicate it inside uh, a virtual lab. And so this is a real event. Uh, uh, this is a typhoon uh, that hit the Philippines uh, in 2012. Uh, so this was a, a deployment of a crisis mapping uh, organization called the Standby Task Force. So we were able to take their data. Uh, this is uh, tweets from people in the Philippines talking about uh, the typhoon. Uh, and uh, we got a group of, uh, of, of workers from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, and in one hour, uh, they were able to, uh, uh, to perform a, a, a task that was very similar uh, to uh, to what the, the real standby task force uh, did over 24 hours uh, during their real deployment. Uh, but at the same time, so this is, the, this is the, the real deployment over here on the left, and this is what these 16 Turkos did in one hour you know, a couple of years later. Very similar map, similar quality of performance, but because we can instrument everything, uh, we know exactly what everybody's doing, who they're chatting to, uh, what type of action they're taking, uh, we can test all kinds of hypotheses about how groups solve problems together. And what we find is that, you know, consistent with uh, prior theory, that when people are in a group, uh, they don't work as hard as when they do on their own. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they uh, collaborate more and they benefit from that collaboration. And these two forces uh, trade off against each other. Uh, and we find that there is this non-monotonic relationship where um, uh, teams, uh, very small teams, uh, initially do worse uh, than similar sized groups of individuals, but eventually uh, they do better uh, as they get bigger. Uh, the, the, the error checking uh, uh, capabilities of a large group eventually outweigh the, the social loafing uh, effects. And you can see right up here in the, the top right that these largest groups in our experiment perform uh, about as well as the real uh, standby task force. So this is, uh, you know, effectively a real-world task uh, in a lab. And then finally, uh, uh, we were able to study um, uh, experiments or run experiments on a much longer time scale uh, than um, uh, than what has been uh, possible in, in physical labs. So this is an example that you may very well be familiar with: the prisoner's dilemma. It's a it's a very standard uh, uh, game theoretic construction of two players interacting with each other. Uh, in a, uh, uh, in a, uh, a, 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 a non-cooperative setting. Uh, and they, 
in in each case, uh, players have a a, a a a a temptation to to do the wrong thing, to behave selfishly, but also an incentive uh, to do the right thing, uh, and hence the dilemma. Um, I'm not going to get into the details here, but the the the, the theory says that in a one shot game, uh, both players should defect, uh, even though uh, it's in their interest to cooperate. Uh, when they play this game uh, repeatedly for a known number of rounds, this is called a finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. What they do in physical labs is they start off by cooperating, and then as the as they get to the end, uh, they defect. And uh, the 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 theory is that uh, if they play this game over and over again, these defections should happen earlier and earlier, um, until eventually all cooperation unravels. And so. Uh, People have been studying this problem for many years, uh, and uh, they had concluded that unraveling was likely. But they also realized that it was impossible to really see it clearly uh, in uh, a physical lab, simply because it was not possible to run the experiment for more than a couple of hours. And so what we were able to do is replicate exactly the experiment that people had done previously, uh, uh, players playing a 10-round game of prisoners two players playing a 10-round game of Prisoner's Dilemma with pretty standard payoffs. Uh, they play a game, uh, then they get randomly rematched to another player and play another game. Then they get randomly rematched to another player and play another game. So we can play a series of games uh, with uh, the same 50 people being randomly rematched with, with each other. This is what a whole session looks like. So everybody is now 50, uh, sorry, 100 players, so 50 pairs of players playing 20 games in succession each of 10 rounds. This is the size of uh, uh, prior to ours that had been done in a physical lab. We were then able to do this 20 times over uh, over the course of a month. Every weekday for four uh, weeks in a row, we had the same 100 people come back uh, and play this game over and over and over again. So we had 4,000 rounds of Prisoner's Dilemma and we showed uh, that over the course of one day, you would get the result that people had been expecting, which is that unraveling uh, started to happen. And here you can see cooperation levels in the last round dropping rapidly over the course of the session. But what we also found is that if you play this game for many days in a row, eventually this unraveling uh, uh, stops. Uh, and this was a surprising result, something that we did not expect, but we were able to explain by identifying the existence of a new type of player somebody who just uh, uh, what we call the resilient cooperator, people who uh, no matter how many times uh, they get uh, mistreated by other people, maintain the same faith uh, in, uh, in others and continue to play as conditional cooperators. Uh, and uh, uh, the other 60% of the players were what we call rational cooperators who are always looking to, uh, um, to, to get uh, ahead of their partner uh, and those players have a tendency to unravel. But this first group, the 40% of, of, of resilient cooperators, uh, they were able to, we showed that they were able to stabilize uh, cooperation at a remarkably high level. Uh, about 80% of the, of the maximum possible payoff was realized consistently by these players day after day after day, even though uh, the resilient cooperators uh, uh, had uh, some small penalty that they were uh, willing to sustain. Okay, so I'm out of time here. I just want to wrap up quickly and say that you know, uh, you know, 20 years ago it would have been hard to imagine all the things that we can do today. And there are some wonderful books written by my colleagues uh, Matt Solganic and and Sandra Gonzalez Bayon, a, a colleague of mine uh, at in the Annenberg School at, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, about you know all of the developments that have happened in computational and social science over the last couple of decades and and what we can uh, do uh, that would have been hard to imagine. Uh, and I think it's also uh, hard to imagine what will be possible in 20 years from now. Uh, but I, I think right now we are in a very exciting period of development where we're seeing uh, experiments get faster and cheaper. We're, develop, we, we're, we're, we're hoping to exploit all kinds of uh, other social senses. Um, uh, you know, David mentioned that I have spent a bunch of time oscillating between academia and industry. Uh, this is uh, an area of intense interest these days in the computational social science world about whether uh, academia and industry can work together more closely to, to, you know, the benefit of society than we have in the past. 
and of course, there's lots of uh, of great um, progress in the in the world of open science that I think is going to uh, improve the quality of the science uh, as well as its accessibility. And then finally, finally, I just want to return to this notion of interdisciplinarity uh, and say, you know, there's good news and bad news. Uh, you know, the bad news is that it's still hard to do. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, Gary Brewer said in the late 1990s, the world has problems, but universities have departments. And I think if we, if we want to solve real world problems, uh, you know, we have to, um, you know, get away from this uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling poem on the right hand side of the blind men and the elephant where, you know, every different discipline has its own sort of theoretical perspective and is looking at the world just through that perspective and coming to different conclusions about its true nature. And we have to be able to step back and work together uh, to, to really sort of uh, think about um, the problems that are relevant uh, outside of our, uh, you know, outside of our academic domains. So these complex real world problems require diverse perspectives and methods. They require team-based science. They require a different kind of science than we've been used to doing in the social sciences for the last several decades. Um, but the good news is that this is starting to change. And I think we see it changing at the level of, of you know, students. Um, uh, and uh, there's some very exciting uh, interdisciplinary training programs. Uh, the Summer Institutes for Computational Social Science is one great example. And uh, I know that they are recruiting uh, graduate students right now for the 2021 uh, program. Uh, there are also uh, you know, wonderful conferences. The International Conference on Computational Social Science is one that I, that I thoroughly recommend. Uh, journals are more and more interested in this sort of work. Funding agencies are interested in this sort of work. So there are, there are really encouraging trends uh, that, that maybe this time is different. And after so many years of, of frustration at the, the lack of interdisciplinarity uh, in research, uh, you know, I hope that, that uh, computational social science will, will prove to be uh, the exception. Uh, and that maybe in 20 years, careers like mine will not be so unusual. So thank you very much. Uh, I apologize for going a bit over, but um, I hope uh, we have some time for questions. Yes, Duncan, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating, uh, very satisfying uh, to find universal structure and networks whose nodes are as diverse as movie actors and electric power stations. Uh, perhaps the most profound aspect of your talk for me was to try to imagine the pre-digitally networked world. I actually lived through it, but it's hard to remember it. So you, you brought a little of that back. <laughs> we have about eight uh, highly voted questions. Most of them, interestingly enough, are about scientific methods, but one stands out as being about a specific result. And that one is, do you project that the mean path length of six uh, among human networks or random networks generally is decreasing over time as the world becomes flatter? Or is that something that we're you know, that, that we think is more, is more universal. Uh, it's a good question. It comes history? up a lot. Uh, yeah. I, I think that the, um, uh, that the, uh, it, it's surprisingly stable. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, and here's why. Uh, I, I mean, I can answer the question in two ways. The, the first answer is that if you, if you sort of remember that uh, slide I showed of, of, you know, path length as a function of, of random rewiring, yeah. uh, you can see that, you know, you get a lot of bang for your buck uh, with the uh, with the initial rewiring, but as you rewire the graph, uh, the the you know the world gets smaller, and once it gets smaller, you have to do a lot more rewiring to get uh, any uh, any marginal uh, decrease in path length. So, once the world becomes small, it becomes very very hard to make it smaller. And so, I think we're well into that asymptotic regime, and I think we were well into it in the 1960s. And so my suspicion is that uh, that things have not changed nearly as much uh, in terms of the underlying network, uh, which is what we're trying to measure. Now, the other thing where I think things have changed is, you know, is that, you know, just because the network is a similar diameter doesn't mean that everything is the same. And so clearly our ability to communicate has changed dramatically in the last, you know, couple of decades. So, if, you know, I might think back to uh, to when I was a graduate student. The only way to communicate with people in Australia was either to write a physical letter and mail it by snail mail, or to to phone them, and that was extremely expensive. It was like a dollar a minute to talk on the telephone. So, 
that was very rare. Now we have, you know, you know, free video chat via FaceTime or Zoom or, you know, any number of ways of communicating. So, you know, we have Facebook, you can see all your friends, you can chat with them, you can see their photos. So the appearance of connectivity has dramatically increased, right? The ability to sort of functionally connect uh, because of, of digital communication has increased dramatically. And so it raises this inter interesting question of like, well, what do you mean by connected? What do you mean by small, right? So just in, in terms of like the pure network topology of social networks, I think things have not changed. But I think that in, in sort of more meaningful senses, they have changed a lot. Thank you. Um, one of the methods questions has to do with ethics. Medical science, of course, has to overcome a lot of privacy and ethical concerns to do experiments. Are computational social scientists becoming similarly restricted by online privacy concerns? Are codes of ethics for social scientists coming into existence like medical scientists have? Uh, the short answer is yes. We, we uh, actually follow the same code of ethics, uh, which uh, you know, stems from the Belmont Report and, uh, and uh, is enshrined in, in human subjects guidelines. Um, you know, the more complicated answer is that that's a pretty imperfect fit for a lot of research that we do. So the experiments that I talked about, uh, the virtual lab experiments are pretty straightforward. In those cases, we follow a very standard method of informed consent where you, you recruit a bunch of people, you tell them what you're gonna do, you know, you have them say they understand it and you, know, you maybe give them sort of test questions to make sure that they understand it. Uh, and then you pay the money and, and you know, everybody's happy, right? Um, uh, for some of the other studies where we are getting email data or click log data, uh, you know, it gets a little more murky because, you know, in theory, that secondary data, uh, it's not uh, considered uh, human subjects research. But, you know, people in, uh, in ethics, in research ethics, are of mixed opinions about how that data should be treated uh, and whether, uh, whether the, you know, even, you know, whether de-identified, uh, you know, uh, individuals um, uh, should be consulted before any of their data is allowed to be used. And so I think this is a, you know, this is a pretty... Um, important and active area of debate right now. And I think that if we, if we want to solve some of these larger problems that will require collaboration between academia and industry, we're going to have to, uh, to, to put these, uh, these ethical questions on, on a, you know, sort of a first order and, and really uh, you know, argue through the, the pros and cons of, of using data of that nature. And, and, and I think so far the debate has not been particularly um, helpful uh, that you, you tend to have uh, people who are, who are dead set against it uh, in principle. And then you have people who just sort of want to do it and not really think too hard about it. And, and neither of those approaches is, is really sustainable. Thank you. When you study email or Twitter cascades, are you accessing reproducible publicly available information or are these experiments in fact hard for other scientists to reproduce? So Twitter is very reproducible because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of that data is, um, uh, you know, there are public APIs. Uh, you can you can go and you know check things for yourself. And Twitter is a very popular um, uh, source of data for exactly that reason. There are other reproducibility issues associated with Twitter, which is that it keeps changing. <laughs> I mean, so. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, when we did our first study of, of you know, retweet dynamics, uh, it was before there was a native retweet button. I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, back in the early days of Twitter, if you wanted to retweet someone, you had to sort of cut and paste the tweet into a new tweet and put RT in front of it. Um, and then suddenly there was a, a native retweet button. And it's, it's sort of like, you know, changing the, the, you know, the universal gravitation constant, like everything... Uh, about the system uh, readjusts. So, so, you know, one of the big problems with using these commercial platforms to do social science is that the platform is not necessarily helping you do, you know, consistent reproducible social science. Uh, with email, it's a totally different ballgame because, uh, you know, that data is considerably more sensitive. Uh, it's generally locked up uh, in, in very sort of secure um, servers. Um, and so, 
to study email, you have to have some kind of a very, very special access. Uh, and we've been very cautious about making any of that uh, data, even in its most sort of uh, stripped down, de-identified form, publicly available, you know, because of the fear that you can never sort of rule out the possibility of re-identification. Mm -hmm. um, so that does, that does uh, uh, cause some problems for, for reproducibility, and we would love to see um, you know, some better solutions to that. Interesting distinction. Um, how can you distinguish between human Twitter users and Twitter bots? How can we rely on data obtained from social media when we know that many accounts are created for propaganda or other commercial purposes? Right. So we have a pretty uh, blunt way of dealing with that, which is really what you might call a whitelist uh, approach, where we rather than rather than trying to screen things out, we just screen things in. So we say we're going to start with you know uh, uh, you know a large sample of people that we feel pretty confident are are real people. Um, uh, you know, other people have, you know, there, there are certainly bot detectors out there that, that you could conceivably use. Um, uh, but I agree that uh, it's always a concern that you, you know, if, if, if uh, um, well, it depends on what you're trying to answer, right? If you're just interested in studying Twitter, bots are a part of Twitter and maybe you want that data in there. If you're trying to make some generalizable statement about, uh, you know, diffusion of information, uh, then you probably, you know, want to, know whether you're just you're you're studying bots or or humans uh so i think it does it you know it depends a little bit on on the question but it's it's something that that we have dealt with in a in a in a sort of fairly um manual way um but uh again you know i, I think uh that there's there's other approaches that are available thank you um in view of the time i'm going to try to merge a couple of the remaining questions and and maybe leave some up in the air for curious people to follow up with. Uh, but um, can you give other examples of questions in sociology that are being addressed through computational means and what sort of leading scale computer experiments are being constructed in sociology today? For example, I'm not aware of any significant fraction of scientific supercomputing resources going into sociology. So you know, what, what's the scale and what's the sort of horizon for computational uh, sociology? Uh, well, so, I mean, those are, those are pretty different questions. Okay. Uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, there are, you know, there's obviously a, a, a wide variety of questions that, that people are studying. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, a, a very, you know, people are very interested these days in, in misinformation and, and propagation of, 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 of fake news and other kinds of misinformation. Uh, people are very interested in social influence and, and human decision making. Um, uh, they're very interested in, uh, you know, uh, human cooperation, uh, diffusion uh, of information generically. Um, you know, problem solving uh, in groups is another big area of interest. In and, and I will note that these are these are all like very classical uh, questions. Like you know, you know, you scientists have been studying cooperation for you know at least a hundred years now. Um, you know, all of the questions that, that I'm interested in, I think, are are you know, go way back in terms of their heritage and and really what we're bringing to them is new types of data and new methods. Uh, you know, it's also, um, you know, so yes, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of a, like a, a question that nobody had thought of asking. I think, you know, maybe the closest that I can think of is these questions about limits to prediction, um, uh, which I think is, is not really something we had thought about a lot in the social sciences um, at all um, uh, until very recently when, when predicting things became uh, you know, because of the influence of computer science and machine learning became much more of a focus uh, than simply, you know, identifying uh, causal effects. Um, in terms of computing scale, um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you, if you think about, uh, you know, computing path lengths on Facebook, um, you know, that's a pretty big, um, you know, that, that's a, a, a you know, there's pretty uh, serious computing resources there. Um, uh, and, uh, but that is mostly handled 
through parallelization, right? So, you know, Hadoop and MapReduce are, are you know, kind of have been a, an important weapon in, in taking, like when, when we were doing, uh, you know, shortest path length calculations back in the 90s, you had to put everything in memory. Uh, and that was, uh, that became uh, unsustainable for, for increasingly large networks. And so then some clever tricks were, were developed to, uh, parallelize uh, path, uh, uh, shortest path length computations. Uh, and that uh, made it possible to do, um, uh, you know, to, to do uh, calculations on, on much, much bigger networks. Um, you know, I think some of the, you know, epidemiology simulations are, are pretty uh, complicated, but I don't, I don't think we're, you know, we're lining up for time on, on national supercomputing resources just yet. Um, it's more that, you know, you want a lot of storage. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, you know, so just, you know, standard cloud services, you know, Amazon, we do, I spend a lot of time and money on Amazon. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, that, that's, a, that's a pretty adequate solution for almost everything that, that we're trying to do. Um, you know, but I don't rule out that at, at some point, you know, it, it might be necessary to to um, uh, to start uh, using some of these, you know, uh, you know, very specialized um, uh, computing resources that we use for like atmospheric science or, you know, you know, nuclear fission simulations or whatever. Thank you. The the answer to the question about the hundred year old questions that, that are simply being now addressed, you know, by better tools reminds me, and this really will be my closing thought, of the uh, statement of Humphrey Davy, the English chemist who discovered mm -hmm. 10 elements of the periodic table by starting to do electrolysis. And he said, nothing tends so much to the advancement of knowledge as the application of a new instrument. Yep. The native intellectual powers of people in different times are not so much the causes of the different successes of their labors as the peculiar nature of the means and artificial resources in their possession. I think you've illustrated that, but along with that, uh, you also illustrated the power of very simple mathematical modeling at the beginning to, to find this, you know, this very differential separation between the clustering and the, and the connectivity distance. So uh, we, we are very appreciative of opening your world to ours. I think maybe you will have inspired a few uh, new thesis ideas, maybe inspired a few people to look up uh, the sociology, uh, the computational sociology summer school. And certainly um, we are, you're now a node on our network in some sense. It would have been better if you were here physically <laughs> in our auditorium, maybe sometime uh, in the future. But let me thank you very much for uh, spending your, your morning with us in Philadelphia. And uh, we, we wish uh, your, you and your research the very best. Thank you from Winter Enrichment at Coast. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Bye. All right.